Uh, yeah, so this is going to be uh, joint work with Jonathan Hickman, subsets of Jonathan Hickman, Nez Katz, and Ray Shang Zhang. Uh, and so a Kikea set is a compact subset of Rn that contains a unit line segment in every direction. So uh, this is almost a Kikea set. We've got all of these unit line segments. If we had five more of these, then we'd, we add it together, then we'd have a full Kikea set. However, you can have <coughs> much smaller Kikea sets, which you can see by pushing this guy into this guy and reducing the measure. So Besikovic was the first to prove that you can have null Kikea sets in this construction due to Perrin. And you can iterate this procedure. So you divide up into more pieces, eight pieces. You push this one into this one, this one into this one, this one into this one, you get this. And then pairwise push them, pairwise push, pairwise push. And then you get this, which has got smaller measure again. So if you iterate the process, you can have sets with zero Lebesgue measure. And the Kikea conjecture asserts that they can't be any smaller than that. And you can have many different interpretations or, or, or ways of measuring smallness, uh, which we will go into. So although it's already quite surprising that they can have such small measure, but the dimension can't be smaller than n, where n is the ambient dimension, is the conjecture. So, or as one of the conjectures. So um, we will consider delta tubes, which are delta neighborhoods of unit line segments. So I'm gonna use this notation quite a lot. I want you to remember. And we're gonna consider families T of delta tubes, uh, which are direction separated, which means that the angle between the core line segments, these line segments, is at least delta. Okay. And we'll also consider direction separated families of delta tubes, which are all contained in the set E. And we'll denote that by T sub E. So another version of the Kakea conjecture, this formulation is due to Guth, is this which I quite like because it doesn't even mention Kikea sets. Um, so you, 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 so for any family of direction separated delta tubes uh, that are contained in E, you must have this inequality where this E is Lebesgue measurable. And why does this tell us something about the dimension of Kikea sets? Because you could in particular take the delta neighborhood of Kikea set K and put it in here. And then because you've got a line segment in every direction, the delta neighborhood uh, contains a lot of delta tubes, right? But not so much, the maximal number of delta separated uh, delta tubes is the reciprocal of this, right? You can't, you don't have enough space to, to, to do more than that, but you can put in a maximal number of delta, sep, de, delta se, direction separated delta tubes. So this is the reciprocal of that. So you have one. So you see that the delta neighborhood of the, the measure of the delta neighborhood of Kikea set is bounded below by delta to the epsilon. So that tells you that the Minkowski dimension is greater than or equal to, or the upper Minkowski dimension is greater than or equal to n minus epsilon. And if that's true for all epsilon, then you've 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 concluded that Kikea sets can't be too small. Um, and so, in two dimensions, that was solved by Davies quite a while ago. Uh, or the, the the dimension versions of the conjecture. And, but it's still open in higher dimensions. And so what we're gonna start, we're gonna start simplifying the problem in order to proceed. 
Okay, ask questions whenever you feel like it, by the way. Um, so, oh, and I'm, I'm going to brush lots and lots and lots of details under the carpet, including all constants will be one essentially, or if there's a constant, there's probably one of these powers in there, right? Okay, so we're, we're going to consider semi algebraic sets as the title indicated. So, a real algebraic variety takes this form, you know, it's the zero set the common zero set of, of a load of polynomials. And a set, so a good example of that is the unit sphere. So if you take x squared plus y squared minus one equal to zero, you get, you get a set which is of this form. Now, a semi-algebraic set allows inequalities. So, so you, a good example of that is the unit ball, because it could be less than or equal to zero rather than equal to zero. So these guys have got the big measure zero, but these guys don't necessarily. And these guys, the ones with non-zero the big measure will be the ones we consider. And so the complexity of this is, no, there's finite unions here, and this is closed under complements. So semi-algebraic sets are closed under complements. The complexity, uh, it's just the sum of the degree of all these polynomials, and you probably have more than one way of representing it. So if you have more than one way of representing it, you take the minimum D. Okay, so a simplification of the K conjecture is this, where we ask for the same thing, but we now put some geometric constraints on E. So we, we ask that it's semi-algebraic. With, with where this constant uh, could depend on the complexity. If it didn't depend on the complexity, then this would already solve the Kikea conjecture because you could approximate any Kikea. Like for instance, I mean, these are, these are semi-algebraic sets. You know, that you got the, this is a polynomial less than or equal to this polynomial, greater than or equal to this polynomial. But the point is the finite union is growing and growing and growing. And so the complexity is blowing up. Now, similarly here, you could approximate your delta neighborhood of the Kikea set with lots of little delta cubes and, and you'd be done. So the, the reason it's a simplification is that we, 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 we only consider one load of complex, complexity, if you like. The constant can depend on complexity. And so this was a conjecture of Guth and Zal. And Zal proved the sort of weaker resonance in four dimensions. And uh, myself and Nets proved it in, in, in higher dimensions and generality. And we're going to refer to this as the, the polynomial wolf axiom theorem. So why is a theorem an axiom? Uh, the point is that you can now throw away the supposition. You could, so we won't do this. You could throw away the supposition that the tubes are delta separated and replace it now with the supposition that the tubes satisfy this inequality. So a, a, a family of tubes T satisfies this inequality whenever you look at subsets of the tubes which are contained in any E, which is semi-algebraic. You could then expect if, so basically this, this inequality is a, a, is a bound on the cardinality of tubes. So that we'll first consider this kind of thing where the E's were delta slabs. And he said, if there isn't enough, if there aren't too many tubes in each delta slab, then that should be enough to conclude that the set is big. And, and so here, this is telling you that, that there aren't too many tubes in any semi-algebraic set. So it's a, a, a stronger condition. And so you could also hope to conclude that that that, that would imply the kick, the, 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 that Kakea sets, well, that sets which satisfy this condition are have full dimension. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of words about the proof of this. Um, it's just going to be a sketch. So, first of all, we consider the, the directions. So the directions look like this. 
the lower dimension of the line segments in E. So we have lots of line segments in E because we've got lots of tubes inside E. Indeed, we, we have a delta ball of directions for every tube. Uh, moreover, these tubes are direction separated. And so for each tube, we have a delta ball of directions. And so we know that all of these directions are in here. So we have this inequality. So now we're reduced to proving that the, the this is the big measure in n minus one dimensions. This is the big measure in n dimensions, but that this is bigger than or equal to this. And then we get the inequality. So, I mean, this is the, in some sense, this is the traditional thing to do with KK. You, you want to say that the set is large, and all you know is that there's lots of di directions. So you want to bound the below E by D. So first of all, we use the tarski seidenberg theorem to show that D is also semi-algebraic. So they proved that the, the orthogonal projection of a semi-algebraic set is also semi-algebraic. Uh, and so we use a couple of applications of that to prove that D, D which is somehow a projection, is also semi-algebraic. So this theorem uh, is a theorem in logic, actually. This tells you that the first order theory of the reals is decidable by reducing the first order theory of the reals to the zeroth order theory of the reals. Now, the first order theory of the reals involves quantifiers and the zero order doesn't involve quantifiers. And so what you're doing, you can, any statement with quantifiers, you can interpret as is the point in the set or not. The decidability of that statement is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the point in the set or not. And then if you can rewrite that set without the quantifiers, then you're reinterpreting any such first order statement in a zero order way. But as Alan would say, you don't need to know any of that. All right, so, uh, but we do need to know that D is semi-algebraic to continue because then we use the gromov yonden algebraic lemma to parametrize D. So remember, a semi-algebraic set is defined kind of implicitly as the zeros of the polynomials. But now this, this lemma tells us we can map onto, so it's a zero of a, a polynomial which goes to zero, but now we can parameterize by R, from Rn minus one to Rn minus one using polynomials. Sorry, with, with, this tells us we can do it with smooth functions and then we approximate with polynomials using Taylor's theorem. Anyway. And, and the reason we want these polynomials is because then we can start doing some vector calculus to somehow conclude this and we use the change of variables formula and you need the, the change of variables formula. I mean, you'd like it to be one-to-one, -one, but if it's Bezu's theorem, which is a sort of higher dimensional version of the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us, you know, the fundamental, so we're gonna see a lot of the fundamental theorem of algebra, that's the point of, introducing polynomials. So the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that a polynomial can only hit zero D times, but it can, that also tells us you can only hit one point D times uh, or many, many times. <laughs> and Bezu's theorem tells us that it can only map K to the N minus one points, isolated points to the same point. And so we do have this kind of one to one, almost one to oneness. Anyway, there's just some details. Uh, some mainly, I wanted to point out that we've got to use these big, big theorems from semi-algebraic geometry. Uh, so back to the Kikia problem proper. So. Uh, this is just a Helder's inequality. I want you to n read this. Uh, so this is the left-hand side of our set inequality. Uh, and we can rewrite it like this, because this is the measure of a tube. 
So if we integrate the characteristic function of a tube, we get this guy. And then by Fubini's theorem, we can pull this out and we get the number of the tubes there. And it's to the power p. So that's just an identity. And then this is a function. Because the tubes are all supported in E, this guy is all supported in E. So we can do Helder's inequality or Jensen's inequality. And we get the support of the function here. And then this in LP. Now, that means that if we can bound this guy by above, from above by this, then if we plug this in here, so first of all, the conjecture, this can only be true above n minus n minus one, over n minus one. And you put this in here, this is zero. So we don't have any constant. So you're just plugging this in, this is bounded by this. So you put that in there, this is bounded by this. Divide through and we get to the power p minus one here. And then you can take away the powers and you get the inequality that we were looking for. So this is a stronger version of the conjecture. It gives you it's the dual of a maximal estimate where you average over the tubes. And you can also conclude from this by an argument due to Bourgain directly that the Hausdorff dimension is bigger than P prime. And note that P prime of this is N. And Hausdorff dimension can be smaller than Minkowski dimension. So this is uh, uh, an exemplification of this being stronger. This, by the way, is also um, of interest in Fourier analysis because the restriction conjecture once you divide things up into wave packets, which live on these tubes, and you apply Kinchin's inequality to get rid of the oscillation, you, you, the restriction conjecture can look a lot like that. And we also got some improvements for the restriction conjecture. So, um, and also others then lifted that into the bochner problem, which is about convergence of of the if you cut off the Fourier transform at a ball of radius R and then you let R go to infinity while you're inverting it, does it converge in LP to its, it, to its function or not? It doesn't, that's not true by Pfefferman because he used the K example to prove that that's not true, but the Bochnerys version smooths out the cut a little bit. Anyway, so some or all of uh, previous contributions to this where, well, I should never say all, should I? But there's definitely other ones actually. So, um, so Cordova proved this with P equal to two and that recovers, that, that's the whole conjecture uh, uh, with, with N equal, in two dimensions. And so N over N minus one is two when N is two. And so that recovers the, 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 the results of Davies. Um, and I'm just going to focus on this one because uh, this, is only, this is only good in higher dimensions. So Bourgain did the same thing with a different number here and then Katzenthal improved it. Um, so how they proved it? They proved this using arithmetic combinatorics. So so they sliced up the set and then they looked at, because the lines are going through the K set like this, if you can take two points and two different, two different slices and subtract them and you get the direction. So that's our lower bound. We know how to lower, take a lower bound of D, remember, right? So they used what's called some, uh, some, some, you use combinatorial bounds on the different sets. You can bound the different sets by the sum sets. So you have the directions are bounded by the different sets, which are bounded by the sum sets. And then the sum sets on a line, if you add two points together, you stay in the line, you stay in the set. So you can bound that above by the set. So anyway, the reason I mentioned that is because it's just very different. And we're going to end up comparing. We're going to see a lot of similarities between their result and ours. And the arguments, as you'll see, are completely different. So next. So first of all, uh, with Jonathan, we, we used this polynomial wolf axiom theorem 
uh, to get an improvement in intermediate dimensions. So after 98, no longer better than this cat's tail button. And so this is somehow, so there's an argument, there was an argument due to Goof, which I'll hopefully get that, that and within the restriction context. And so what we did is we rewrote his induction argument as a recursive algorithm in order to feed in this polynomial wolf axiom information. Because without, without, without this polynomial wolf axiom, you don't get an improvement within the Kagea context. But now that we had this, we could do this. Anyway, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. It goes by polynomial partitioning. So polynomial partitioning, uh, uh, relies on the stone Tukey polynomial ham sandwich theorem, and which is proven using the Boursac Ulam theorem. So, the Boursac Ulam theorem says that if you have a function on the sphere and you flatten it, if you like, uh, sorry, that's a different version. So, uh, there is a version of this theorem where if you take a beach ball and you flatten it, and then you look, then, then two antipodal points must hit the same point on the, in the flattened version of the beach ball. Anyway, the, I'm going to use this version, which is any continuous function odd in the sense that antipodal points map to the opposite value, then there must be a point which is zero. So this is like an intermediate value theorem, right? If you've got a continuous function which is negative and then it's positive, there must be a point where it's zero. Now, you can use that to prove that any family of sets, there is a polynomial for which its variety, its associated variety, bisects each of these sets with respect to any measure which isn't singular, like a, a absolutely continuous with respect to the big. I don't want to tell the proof of this, but it's quite it's, it's quite simple. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can't resist. So if you define this function by measure of A on one side minus measure of A on the other side, then clearly if you change P to minus P, then it's going to change its value. So you've identified the polynomials with points. And so you've so you know this, so you know there's a point where it's zero, so you know there's a point for which it's zero, so you know there's a polynomial for which it's zero, which means that that is equal to that. Anyway, so we're going to use that. The our measure is the big times this function, right? And so, sorry, the big measure mu is the big measure times this function to the power p. So we can divide up this integral into these equal point points, equal pieces, and. We can iterate the process. So, you, so, so first of all, you take two. You take one set, you divide it in two. You take two sets, you divide each of those. You've got four. You, then you take those four sets, you divide each of those with a, another polynomial. You've got eight pieces. So you can get as many pieces as you want with the degree of the polynomial going up. And so this is roughly what you have: that you have d to the n summons here for a polynomial of degree d. And so this is useful, I'll explain in a second. But so we, we don't want, uh, first of all, we need to fatten this algebraic variety, turn it into a delta neighborhood and subtract it from each of these guys. We call these guys cells, we call this guy the wall. And so if that was a partition and we just remove this wall from each of the cells and then add it in a part, then that's just another partition. So why did we do this? We did this because we want to use the fundamental theorem of algebra, of course. So we know that a line only crosses this guy no more than D times because you can... The line going through the polynomial, you can sort of bring it down onto the, the real line, and it's the same thing as a one-dimensional polynomial intersecting a line. So intersecting uh, equal to zero, 
on the real line. So um, we want to know that the, 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 these, these, the, the, the number of these guys isn't too big, right? On average, at least. And so we, 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 don't, we want to say that these tubes can't interfere with too many of these guys. And what's for sure is that the, the, the core line cannot cross this too many times. But now that we've fattened this guy out, we know that because the tubes are not lines, they're fat lines. So because we, we give ourselves a little bit of margin here, a little bit of margin here, we can conclude that genuinely a tube can only hit D plus one cells. So that should be D plus one, but this is a neater formula. So, so as you count these up, you're only counting them D plus one too many times. So you have this inequality. So this is giving us some kind of orthogonality that, that it's all very well cutting that up. But what's the point of cutting it up if we can't say that this guy is somehow simpler? And we can't. It's got fewer tubes. In fact, we can say that this is true, that, that because this has to be true, we know that the, the majority of these guys has to satisfy this inequality because if they didn't, then you could, if most of them were, if these guys were bigger than this, you could multiply by this dn and you would break this inequality. So we know that most of these guys, you've got a much smaller number of tubes to deal with. So that's why, that's why polynomials. So, um, and so this guy, these tubes are kind of a delta neighborhood of an algebraic variety is a semi-algebraic set. So that this guy we're going to deal with using the polynomial rule axioms. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if this guy is, is dominating, so either this guy is bigger than this guy or vice versa. So first of all, we'll consider the case when this guy is bigger than this guy. And so we call this the non-algebraic case and we call this the algebraic case. So let's throw this, let's suppose we're in the non-algebraic case, we throw that guy away because this guy's bigger. And we times by two or four for some reason. That's probably a reason why I have four. Oh yeah, of course, when we remove this wall, uh, when we remove the wall, some of the, these aren't exactly the same size anymore. Some of them could be even very small. So we throw away all the small ones. This is big. So we throw away the small ones. So now these are all roughly the same size again. Okay, and also we'll throw away the ones where this is not true. So, and then just times by two, because they're all roughly the same size. And then, uh, what's next? Uh, yeah, so then we iterate the process. So we can do polynomial partitioning again on this guy. And what happens there is, so T is replaced by this guy. And, you know, we get another sum in here, which is less than D. And so we just keep doing it. And what happens is, do it K times, supposing that the non-algebraic case is dominant each time, not the algebraic case. We can do it K times. And this is just getting bigger. This is, well, getting smaller. Uh, but we do need to be careful about this guy, right? Because constants don't matter, but those kind of constants do matter. And uh, and then finally, we know that there can no, be no more than delta to the n minus one tubes. And I just put the supremum here. So on the following slide, we're just going to use this inequality, this inequality, and this inequality. So this is the, the initial inequality and then a couple of inequalities regarding the number of the cardinality of the tubes. And we're gonna finish on the next slide. Finish the non-algebraic case. So imagine we just keep going and these cells just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. What happens then? So this guy becomes like a ball of, of radius delta. So there we go, that's just the inequality. So then we can just bound this completely trivially. This, this is the measure of the ball. And this guy is no bigger, no, no bigger than the cardinality of the tubes, right? To the power P. So that's completely trivial. Then I just separate this out. I take, I want, I want this guy, I want the sum 
the L1 sum. So I remove the L infinity to the power of P minus one, right? That's just trivial. Maybe it's some kind of hell those inequalities. And um, then we've got a bound for this guy. That's from the previous slide. We've got a bound for this guy. That's from the previous slide. Whack them in. And so there we go. This is replaced by this. And this guy is replaced by this. So we're doing well. But now we've got lots of keys. And we're worried about this key, of course, blowing up. And so we're going to collect all the keys together. And this, don't try and do this in your head, but that's what it gives you. That's just a, an, a, an equality, uh, an identity. And so what's the point here? Now we get, this is what we wanted. And this is fine. And what's this here, right? This, as long as P is bigger than N over N minus one, this can be smaller than one over eight if we choose the degree of the polynomial at the beginning to satisfy that, right? We can just choose the, the, choose D large enough so that this is smaller than one. So that's just lots and lots of pieces. And then, so then we, no we don't have to worry about this guy anymore because we can gobble it up with this guy. And that's it. So the non-algebraic case is great as long as P is greater than N over N minus one, but that's the critical exponent anyway. Now, what about if things don't go as well? And for instance, remember we had this algebraic term, the E, the wall. What happens when one of those guys is the dominant case? Well, then we carry on polynomial partitioning inside that wall. And so we end up doing an argument very similar to this, but well, in a kind of m-dimensional or n minus one-dimensional context, and if we keep going, we get to m dimensions. And so, I'm going to do show you what this looks like. And uh, if you're doing it in, for instance, the delta neighborhood of an m-dimensional hyperplane, so it's just the numerology changes. So you get some m's appearing, and the first problem that you get is that in order to close this induction. P has to be larger. And so, and this is using the polynomial Wolf axiom. So remember, this is the num this is a bound on the total number of tubes that you have. It's not so obvious. Well, if it's an M-dimensional hyperplane, then it's obviously this. But if it's an M-dimensional variety, it's not so obvious. But that comes from the polynomial Wolf axiom. So I'll show you that in a second. Anyway, how do we keep going then? If this P is small. In order, in order to close out here, we need to have a higher P. So we need to do some kind of Helder's inequality to get this P larger. And that introduces a, an inefficiency. But mainly, the biggest problem we have is, has been hidden by some notational trickery that before I told you so now we're in the algebraic case. Before I, told, I said that T sub E means that the tubes are contained, completely contained in E. But notice that these cells, this is like, say, the cell, the radius of the cell is this lambda to the n minus 1. It's getting much smaller than 1. So the tubes, which are length 1, cannot be contained within the cell. They can only be this much contained in the cell. If the, if the radius of the cell is lambda to the n minus one. So this is our E. This is the delta. If, if we drop down a dimension and we're inside this n minus one dimensional variety, um, the tubes can be sort of partially contained, but not entirely contained. And so that introduces an inefficiency as well. I'll come to it in a moment. So we continue polynomial partitioning, however, and, and we drop down dimensions as we need to. And, you know, in this double induction, either you get to the end or you get to the bottom, right? And so how do we deal with these guys? Um, well, we use 
uh, well, so, sorry, what is the cardinality bound on how many tubes do we have to deal with is the main issue, right? So before I told you about this theorem, but we also proved this theorem, right? So we also proved the version which for only partially contained tubes, but then you are paying a price. And these lambdas are small numbers, kind of uncontrollably small, bigger than delta, but smaller than one. And so we need to make sure that in the previous argument, they go away. So when we do Helder, we gain some of those lambdas so we can kind of balance things out. And that's how we get results. Sorry, maybe I should continue a little bit. So the point is this semi-algebraic set here is this set here. And so we put it in here because we want a card in a bound on the number of tubes that we have to deal with. So we put that in there. Of course, if this was an M-dimensional hyperplane, then that would mean the size of this would be lambda to the m times by delta to the power of the co-dimensions. And that's true in general by a theorem of Wonku. So I put that in there. And then I collect my deltas and my lambdas together, and I get this cardinality bound, which is what I told you we used in the previous thing when we're in n-dimensional case, but we're paying this price. But So that's it. So far, um, not the whole talk, uh, hopefully. How long have I got? I've got another nine minutes, right? So, um, so we went on to improve this again. So how did we improve this? We, this lambda, if we're in the n-dimensional case, we use this lambda n. However, these lambdas are bigger. You know, as we come, we're doing the polynomial partitioning, things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So these lambda m's are smaller than these lambdas. So if we could replace some of these lambda m's by some of these lambdas, we, we'd be in better condition. That's exactly what we do. Uh, so we used, so here we used lambda m, but we can use, go back to scale lambda to the n minus one. We don't need to use this huge e. So remember, we've got the measure of e over here, and so we don't want that guy. But we, these, all of this information restricts where the tubes are. So actually, we can find a much smaller semi-algebraic set, uh, which, which contains all of the appropriate pieces of the tubes. And so, or contains, yeah, a lambda n minus one piece of the tube. So this is the theorem. So we just get these improved lambdas, as I said. And we use this, but for the appropriate E, uh, we have to bound the volume of it. Um, so we know that the tubes are lambda one contained in the, this is lambda, this is the M dimensional variety. And we know that the lambda two piece of the tube is contained in this bigger, the, the lambda N minus one, version so we don't need to use this whole thing because we know that these are tubes and the only they, they don't like wrap around like that they go straight right tubes go straight so you can use algebraic arguments like what i was telling you about before with the theorem with nets to prove that i mean if this was just a tube we would know just by trigonometry what the size of this sprouted set would be but because it's an algebraic variety, it can do strange things, so you have to prove it. But you do get the expected bound. But we only need to consider this set intersected with this set, and that's our E. We know that all the tubes, the, the, a lambda two portion or a lambda n minus one portion of the tubes is contained in this red set. And we calculate the volume of it using trigonometry, algebraic algorithms, Wonku, and that gives us that theory, that 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 improved that improved uh, cardinality bound on the number of tubes that we have to deal with in the previous argument. And when you balance everything out to make sure that the lambdas all go away, um, you get this improved result, which now is better than cat's tail in all dimensions. Right? They're maximalist. So. Um, Finally, we talked at the beginning, 
Ah, and sorry, Zhao proved this simultaneously, this final refinement where you, 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 you that I just described. And so um, this, I told you before, tells you something about the Hausdorff dimension of Kakea sets. So what is the corollary of this result for the Hausdorff dimension of Kakea sets? Uh, is this right so you calculate p prime of each of these well sorry p prime is a bit odd i should say because why is it be you know why is it jumping around actually we're doing all this in the multilinear context and then we use an argument due to Brogan and goof to change multilinear things into linear things and that is more efficient you have to choose the linearity and the linearity, the optimal linearity might not be an integer, or it normally isn't an integer, and so you have to compromise. So in some dimensions, it's better than in other dimensions. However, all of these numbers are less than this. And so if we just use this as our P, we get this as our P prime. But actually, our P primes are, are slightly better than that. Right? And uh, so, and if you use the cat's tail maximal estimate, then you get, you only get this, right? So this number is bigger than this number. So we're happy with that. However, cats and tau also using their arithmetic combinatorial techniques directly in the set conjecture rather than the maximal estimate conjecture, they did better than this, they did this, which is exactly the same. Well, it's not exactly the same. It's this, sorry. This is always slightly bigger than this. However, it's not always bigger than this because we're getting these strange p's, and so sometimes better and sometimes for an infinite number of dimensions, it's better, and for an infinite number of dimensions, dimensions, it's worse. Which, given the the, the arguments are as different as they are, is pretty. Rad. So, uh, so that's me. I've got time just to mention some history rather than take credit for all of this. So, De Vere introduced polynomials into the finite field, Wool's finite field version of the K conjecture. He solved it. And that was then extended to the maximal version. And then they started trying to bring these polynomial arguments into, particularly Goof, into the Euclidean problem. However, so how does this work? You, the, the zero set of the polynomial picks up the points because you actually have isolated points in the finite field conjecture. And Goof here was kind of putting the, 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 the variety through the center of these balls where there was high multiplicity. And these arguments all kind of in a similar vein. And so what really changed the game, if you like, was Goof and Katz solved Erdos's distance problem by partitioning the space, as I've just described. Well, not quite as I just described. As I just described, it was largely because here they just needed the zero set. Here he needed a fat zero set. And so really what all, all we did was turn his induction argument into uh, an iterative algorithm like I explained in order and, to, and improve the cardinality bounds on the number of tubes that you need to consider at each stage. All right, so that's me. Thank you very much.